Okay, welcome back. So let, let me review the content of the class up to now, just to see where we are for the next phase of the class. So early on, I indicated to you how species originate. There are different pathways in which species originate. There are also the alternative pathways that we can think of on how a species go extinct. So there is this the, uh, change, right, to a species originating and going extinct, and during that period, during that period where a species are alive, alive, they they disperse and then they overlap the ranges with other species. This overlap of a species ranges creates then uh, different patterns. One of the most uh, striking patterns of all of these species, again, originating, dispersing, and overlapping the ranges is that when you look at a given place, you can count then how many species are there. And you can start from all the way up to the global scale, how many species are there in the planet, all the way down to how many species are there in Waikiki. And again, it comes down to these species overlapping the regions that determine this very interesting pattern that we call a species richness. I, I had decided to break the class on a species richness into two different lectures. One that we're gonna be looking at today, which are the patterns. So I wanna describe to you some of the patterns that are there globally, on how many species are there in the world, where are they? And in the following class, we will move into the processes. Why are the patterns the way they look? So when we think about biogeography, and it, as it relates to a species richness, there are obviously hundreds of questions that have been formulated, but two of the most pressing or most important questions as they relate to a species richness in biogeography is how many species are there, right? And the second one is where are those species and why are they on those places? So let's break down here the first question of how many species are there in the planet. When you look at the species that we have actually put a name to, the magic number comes to about 1.5 million species. Those are the, the species that have a name according to the Linnaean system of classification that we saw previously. And here you can see the number of species by taxonomic groups. For instance, in vertebrates, all of the species that share a backbone, the total number comes to about 57 species that had a name. I want you to keep a, dis a, keep a distinction here. These are the species that had name, 1.5 million species. And here, are how, here is how they are divided among the different groups. But how many are there in total though? We have managed to give a name to 1.5 million, but how many are there in total? Unfortunately, when you look at that answer, one way that you can get to this answer of how many species are there is to count them directly. Basically, I go there and I count one species by one. Unfortunately, when you look at the data that comes from this approach, you realize the magnitude of the uncertainty that we have today as it relates to how many species are there in the planet. So here on this axis, on the Y axis, I had the number of species that had a name that have been described, and here the year. So you can see how the whole thing got started back in, 19, in the 1700s when Linnaeus proposed his method, and then after that, people from around the world started to get crazy about putting names to the species. And here you can see by the end of uh, this century, when in reality, easily, we could have given names to about 1.5 million species. This number actually oscillates a lot, I'm not gonna get into that today, because something that is called synonyms. Basically, different, especially back in the day when people were in different places, naming these species, it turns out that many times, scientists picked up the same species and gave them different names on different parts of the world, then to realize that they were the same species. That's what is called a synonym. So that synonym that we see today is complicated because unfortunately, it tends to inflate at times the number of species that we really know. So basically, again, if you look at this strain of a species described over time, what you can see is that there is not an asymptote. If this number was kind of flattening, you will, get, you will think then that we are already reaching uh, the description of all of the species in the planet. But the reality that every time that we go and sample new species, we come out with tons of new species, tells you already that this direct count is not reliable for them to know how many species are there in the planet. And that's the reason why I make a distinction earlier on for you to know that the 1.5 million species that had a name are the species that we know of, not all of the species that are there. As a result, scientists have come up with an indirect way to get to that number. Obviously, it has proven very hard for us to count all of the species in the planet. Is there an alternative method that we can use to count how many species are there in the world? So, there are different approaches that have been developed by scientists. One is what is called biodiversity patterns. Basically, this idea that you can look at biodiversity patterns that are there in the planet that we can document easier to then extrapolate how many species are there in the world. 
The, full, the first of such approaches was introduced by Raven back in 1983, and he calculated, according to his method, that in the world there could be anything between three and five million species. That's the magic number that he came out back in the day. The way that he did it was this. So we know that there are about 1.5 million species that have been described. We know that two thirds of those species occur in temperate regions. The reason being at higher latitudes is where governments are richer and they can afford to pay scientists to go and describe those numbers. So that's the reason why about two thirds of the species at higher latitudes have been described because there has been a lot of money put in that, but also because of those places by the high latitudes have fewer species. So it has been kind of not only easier, there have been a lot of resources and that explains why two thirds of the species that are found today with a name have been found at the Tempe regions. And then he said, you look at the global pattern of biodiversity, it turns out that the ratio of temperate regions to tropical regions is two to one. For every two species that are in the tropics, there is only one species at higher latitudes. So given some mathematics that you play out with these proportions, he suggested then that the total number of species in the planet could be anything between 3 and 5, uh, 4.5 million species in the planet. Unfortunately, he acknowledged on this thing that this calculation doesn't include bacteria nor other microbes. And it was later on described though that there were several limitations to this. While this, for instance, while this uh, ratio is true to many taxa, uh, there are several taxa that remain homogeneous over very large geographical extent. So there have been no, numerous criticisms to, to this uh, way to, to get to how many species are there in the world. The other method was introduced by Robert May back in 1988. Uh, in his method, I'm gonna explain in a second, he pointed out that there could be easily between 10 and 15 million species. So how did he come up with that number using a biogeographical pattern? So here, he took the data on all of the species that were described at the time, and he looked at the body sizes of those species. So what he did here, he plot the number of species against how many species are found at different body sizes, all of the ones that were known, and he found this pattern. So one of the things that you can see from this pattern is that the species that are large, as we described before, are few of them, right? And because they are so huge, that explains why we know them very well. But then he found this gap here, right? At the, at the species that have very small uh, body sizes. And he speculates that the reason why this gap occurs is because those are the species that need to be named. So basically his argument is, well, Obviously, we, we, need, we need to sample the remaining part of the world, and unfortunately, the species that we have failed to sample are the species that are small because we cannot see them well. So he speculated that this gap that you see in the body size, what is called, this is what is called the body size frequency distribution. This gap that you observe here is basically uh, an uncertainty coming from as no sampling. So what he did, he took this equation here and he extrapolated to find out what is the gap there, assuming again that those species that are there are the ones that are unknown. And um, if you extrapolate this gap and calculate the number of species below the line, the number comes between three and 50 million species. That was proposed by Robert May. Unfortunately, it was actually one of uh, Robert May colleagues, a guy called Kevin Gaston, that then came out with a paper in PNAS pointing out that these frequency distributions actually change from place to place. So actually one friend of Robert May kind of um, proved this idea not right. So this biodiversity pattern, well indeed, the, this pattern holds for many species. It has been shown that when you analyze all of the species, the, this pattern of the body size frequency distribution doesn't hold, meaning that this gap here might not be necessarily the fact that we haven't studied them well. It might be a legit pattern. The other method that has been used, again, using biodiversity patterns to extrapolate how many species are there is the species area relationship. As I explained to you several times in the class already, as you start increasing the area that you sample, you normally start increasing the number of species, but that number of species start flattening. So the idea here was introduced by these two guys here, Grassley and Masiolet. Grassley is a, a guy from, from New York, I believe, I forgot, Rogers. So he's, I believe he's a Rogers, but don't quote me on that. So in his method, Grassley calculated that on the oceans alone, there could be up to a 10 million species of which only about 300,000 had a name. So what he did was this. So this is the sampling area that he used. You can see Long Island here. This is in the Pacific Ocean, sorry, in the Atlantic Ocean. So what he did is he went and sampled these areas and he counted using quadrants how many species are there. And here you can see, for instance, the number of species as he accumulated the number of samples, right? So you get this species aggregate relationship that we saw before. 
So what he did here, he then extrapolated this area here to the total area of the world's oceans and then calculated how many species were there and he estimated according by extrapolating this line that there could be 100 million species in the planet. Obviously, the big mistake of this approach is the fact that there are biogeographical regions, as we explained before, from after, before and after them, the composition of a species changes quite dramatically. So this idea that Grassley used here assumes that the distribution of a species is sort of homogeneous around the world, which we have proven is not right because of these biogeographical regions. So this extrapolation, again, is maybe an overestimation of the real thing. Again, there's, he, he kind of described that, they described that on that paper, right? Saying, well, 100 million seems to be a very high number, so just for the sake of playing conservative, we pre presume that the number of species is 10 million. So obviously something that is completely unti a scientist, which is to, to the data giving you something, and then you're saying, well, that seems to be too high, let me make it 10 million. But again, it just points out the fact that we are just struggling as a scientist to find out a way to count how many species are there in the planet. This is another approach that was introduced by Erwin from the Smithsonian back again in the day. This is what he, with the, he went to the Amazon and there are obviously these humongous trees. He got this machine gun that uh, spells a smoke into the canopies of the trees and he put fences at the bottom, at the, at the bottom that capture all of their insects that, that die after he's shooting these uh, trees. And then he analyzed the insects that were on those samples and what he found is that of all of the insects that were found on a given tree, on the canopy of a given tree, 160 of them were beetles. And that's something that he knows very well. He doesn't know the rest, but he knows the beetles very well. So he found that 160 beetles were specific to the one tree. He also found on his sample, when he analyzed the beetles in comparison to all of the species that, of insects that were there, the beetles represent only four out of 10 insects. That then allows him to calculate that the total number of insects per tree will be about 400 species. We're talking that for every species of tree in the Amazon forest, there could be up to five, 400 unique species in, of insects. This is insects alone. Now, what it remains then is to know how many species are on the, on the lower part of the tree. All what he analyzed was the canopy. He, yes, he used this ratio here that two out of the three insects that live on a tree live on the canopy that allows him then to calculate that on a single tree, there are 600 species. Again, when you look at the canopy of the forest in a given tree in the Amazon, 400 species are there that are insects. That is about two thirds of the total insects in the tree. That means that in the total tree, there could be up to 600 species. Trees are obviously easy to sample because they are huge, they don't move. So we know relatively very well the number of species of trees in the world and that number came to be about 50,000 species. So basically what he did, and he speculated that if every tree has 600 species and there are 50,000 species of trees, then the total number of uh, species in the world will be 30 million just for the insects. So I, I want you to pause this for a moment and think what kind of limitations can you foresee on his approach? Keep in mind that this was in 1983 and there has been some criticism to it just for you to start figuring out where the potential flaws on this error. Okay, you came back from this, several limitations were identified with this. The first one was the idea that the, these ratios remain constant from place to place. Actually, several places around the world rep, rep, duplicated the study and they found that these ratios of some species to the total pool of species changes quite a lot from place to place. As a result of this ratio being very different from place to place, this calculation that uh, Erwin Rich could be potentially very variable from place to place. That was kind of the biggest limitations of this one study. Now a scientist got fed up with this. So we have tried everything as a way to count how many species are there, but we just don't know. But one thing that we had are these experts that have been focusing on specific groups and these people have been studying these taxa for, for years. So they get to know relatively very well the diversity of these taxa. So another app tool that has been used to come out with how many species are there in the world is the, the, the opinion of experts. The way that that works is that some guy goes there and a scientist and start asking all of these uh, big shots, how many species are there in the world. Somebody actually already did this, this one guy, Robert May, and he calculated that on the opinion of the experts, there could be anything between 3 million and 100 million species. 
So that alone there gives you a sense of the uncertainty that we had about the diversity of the species in the planet. When all of the experts, that are the ones that know, tell you that there could be anything between three and a hundred million, that's a huge uncertainty. I want you to think about that uncertainty, like for instance, the money that you had in your bank account. You can either have uh, $3 or you can have $100. So obviously that distinction is important to you for you to know how much you do, do you spend, right? If you spend $3, you lost all of your capital. If there are only $3 in your bank account, if there are $100, then you can afford to lose $3. The same thing goes here. For us to know this number, how many species are there in the planet, and reducing this uncertainty is important so that we can better contextualize the current extinction crisis that we have. We are driving species at a rate of easily 20,000 species a year. Is that a lot or not? That depends on how many species are there in the planet. And unfortunately, as you can see here, that uncertainty is very large. So there is a huge risk that there could be massive consequences on the loss of species that we had today. And unfortunately, all of that depends on us knowing better how many species are there in the world. Now, with that being said though, even this range has been brought into question. And there was a, another guy, Boucher, sorry, I, I, that's no Boucher, I forgot the name of this guy. He's a French a scientist that kind of even questioned the idea of trusting the opinion of experts. And he used in his paper a very interesting statistic how one given a scientist, for instance, at a given time said that there were 100, 100 million species of nematodes. As you can see, land, Land's head here, he said there were 100 million species of nematodes in 1993. But the same guy, Land's head, and Boucher in another paper just three, 10 years ago, he said that there could be no more than a million. So we are talking about here that the same scientists in 10 years time went from saying that there were 100 million to then saying there is only a million. And obviously that's the way it goes, right? Scientists start working on this thing and every time you get new understanding of these problems. So the point, being, the point being made here is the fact that even the opinion of experts is not a reliable metric. Uh, one thing that I did on that paper, and I recommend you to have a look at that paper, that is uh, one of the top 100 most important scientific discoveries of 2011, according to Discovery Magazine, out of the millions of papers published that year, that one paper that I'm gonna to describe to you now is one of the top 100. One thing that I did on that paper, though, was this. Again, as I explained to you, one of the big no-no's about scientific presentations is never put too many letters on a slide, but I decided, again, to violate my own rule here, just to, to make a point to you. In this, in this column here, I had all of the scientific methods that have been used to describe a calculation of how many species are there in the world. What we did on that paper was to take all of the papers that have made a calculation, categorize that on these different groups, describe how many species are, were, were there, but then point out the limitations of the method. So one thing that you can see is that for every method that has been proposed, there has been a limitation. And in some cases, in fact, the method has been criticized by the guy who invented the method himself. Like for instance, this example here, how Robert May, which is the guy that I just described to you, used the pattern of the body sizes of the species to create the frequency distribution of body sizes to come out that there will be between 10 and 50 million species. Yet it was the same Robert May that many years later then questioned the, the idea that that pattern could be reliable. So again, the point that I wanted to make here is that even among scientists, we understand this huge uncertainty about how many species are there in the world, mostly related to the fact that all of the methods that we have proposed had limitations of their own. So one of the things that happened early on in my career, when I was a, a PhD, I just was finishing up my PhD, I got this phone call from a guy called Ransom Myers that was described by Fortune Magazine as one of the top 10 people that could change the world. And the guy calls me and he say, hey, I saw a paper that you just published in Nature. I want you to come and work with me and let me meet in Japan. And I was, yeah, I was like, yeah, sure. Can you imagine? I, I am Colombian, very famous for drug trafficking. I'm getting a phone call from a random guy telling me to go from Canada to meet this guy in Japan. And I was just like, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I just didn't believe anything that he told me. Then I went and told my supervisor at the time about this one guy. And my supervisor, Peter Schell, said to me, are you crazy? That's one of the most famous scientists in the world. So yeah, with that opportunity in mind, I just went to Japan and I started to work with Ram Myers. Ram Myers, turns out that he had a big budget, like a, a huge amount of money, whose main purpose was to quantify how many species are there in the world's oceans. That's it. Tons of people wanted to put money into answering the question of how many species are there in the oceans. So one thing that we did was to 
to bright to nature. We wanted to increase the scope, the stake of doing the project. We know we knew the we knew that we didn't have the money to work on it, but we wanted to, to increase the scope on this just so that we can gather all of the data that we needed to do this. So we sent a, a letter to the editor from Nature, and we told the editor from Nature there is a question here that needs to be answered, which is how many species are there in the world, and we described to her that that question doesn't have an answer. And we say now we had the money, we had about 2,000 scientists from around the world working, collecting this data, we can do it. So we were there like, yeah, we can do it. So the editor from Nature responded back saying, yeah, go ahead, do it. So with that in mind, now we only had, we had the money and we now have the most prestigious journal in the world saying if we managed to come up with an answer that we'll publish our paper. So with that in mind, we started to collect data like you guys cannot imagine. We collected data on the body size of all of the species in the world. We didn't leave a single species behind and we put all of the data together and we realized that the body size is incomplete. We created accumulation curves for all of the species in the world thinking that we can maybe extrapolate the, the, the pattern of species over time to how many species are there in the world. Unfortunately, that data was too incomplete as well. We analyzed diversity ratios, again, using the same approach that was used earlier by Erwin that I told you about and looking at different ratios and maybe see if there is a magic ratio that will allow us to predict maybe the total number of species in the world based on a few species. But unfortunately, again, we came to understand that those ratios are very viable from place to place. So we worked on this for, a, for several years and eventually we ended up going, going back to nature to say, saying to nature, sorry, we couldn't do it. So just for you to realize that sometimes things don't, don't work your way despite the fact that you might have everything that you need, including money and the stake of potentially getting a paper in nature. And I mean, for me, it's kind of crazy to, to summarize a couple years of work on my life on, on this half a slide here. So I decided, obviously, that's how it goes. I decided to move to something else, and I was kind of clearing my desk one day, and I, one thing that I always used to do, not so much anymore, is to read scientific papers just to keep up to date on what is going on here. And I, I was used to have a huge pile of papers, and I was moving the pile of papers from the papers that I need to read to the papers that I already read, and I came across this paper. This paper, I'm not joking, has two pages long, it has been cited like three times by the author himself. So the chances to me, for me to see this paper are close to nothing. I, I am just struck by the fact that this paper, that I managed to come across this paper. This paper was written by a guy called Ricotta in Spain. And what he did, again, it's pretty, pretty, pretty brief paper, has been cited almost no times. What he did there, he took the number of species on a given location in Spain, and he wanted to find out how many species are there on, in Spain itself. So what he did, he looked at the taxonomy hierarchy that we explained before of all of the species that were on that place. And basically, for instance, at the kingdom level, there was one, uh, that then follows class, then follows uh, order, family, genus, species, you name it. So basically what he did, he plotted the taxonomic rank here on the x-axis, again, how many taxa are at that taxonomic level? And what he say is this, obviously, higher taxonomic levels we know very well. Like, for instance, the chances of us describing a new kingdom today are close to nothing. The ones that are there are the ones that we already know. At the species level, we keep describing more, but they already belong to the kingdom. The point here is that we know very well the, 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 the number of taxa at, at higher taxonomic levels, but we don't know the number of taxa at the species level. But one of the things that he found that was pretty cool is that you can use then the taxonomy hierarchy to extrapolate how many species are there. So as soon as I saw that figure, I, I was super excited because it turns out that I did have the data not only of one place like Ricotta, I did have the species of the entire world, all of them, over 1.5 million species names I already did have there. And what I did, I replicated his analysis. I saw this paper at about 10 in the morning and I, I, I say, I'm gonna spend two more hours until lunch on this. I already spent two years. Let me just waste two more hours on this paper. I rerun all of the analysis. And what I did was to apply his method to a taxonomic group that we knew very well. So I run the things for like mammals, I believe. We know very well that there are about 5,000 species of mammals. I recalculated the ricotta approach and the calculation using this method gave me 5,000 for mammals. All right, so that was exciting. I still get the goosebumps thinking about this moment, right? Because again, I almost gave up the whole thing. I decided to run it for birds, and we know that birds are about 10,000 species, and I rerun my calculations using this method, and this method came out to saying that there were 10,100 species. So now, 
I went from something that could be trivial to now something that could be significant. I remember running to my supervisor, Boris Wong at the time, telling him that we finally figured out a scientific method that we can not only validate, that, 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 can do, that will give us a number of how many species are there in the world, but we can also validate that method. So we were super excited. We sent the paper, we sent the letter back to nature after we told nature that we couldn't do it. We wrote back to them say, saying, hey, nature, we did it. We, we want to submit this paper. And unfortunately, nature says, sorry, we don't want it anymore. So basically, again, that's another thing with these high profile journals is the fact that there are timings for getting these things out there. And unfortunately, we cannot lose the wagon with this one paper. It still went to be, again, one of the top 100 discoveries. But unfortunately, it was not in nature. It was in plus biology that is still a pretty prestigious journal. So how does it work? So here on these black lines, you can see the cumulative number of taxa over time at the kingdom, at the phylum level, class, order, family, genus, and the species, right? Again, this is the taxonomy hierarchy that we had talked earlier. But one of the things that happens here is that these higher, higher orders, higher in the higher taxonomic classification is reaching that asymptote. As a result, we can potentially extrapolate to what it could be the asymptote, basically assuming that everything remains the same using different mathematical models. What will be the total number of order? What will be the total number of families? What about the total number of genus? And what we can apply those models at the higher taxonomic level because they are ap approaching an asymptote, we cannot apply it to the species richness because the species richness is still pretty steep. So what we did, we take the number of taxa that is found at every taxonomic level and we plot that against the taxonomic level and we get this plot here. You can see it's almost a, a straight line here between the taxonomic level, how many taxa are there and the extent to which you can extrapolate that to the species richness. So we decided to now for the first time in the history of humanity after 250 years collecting data and struggling to come up with a method. We have now a method that gives a number that, but that we can validate. The validation of that method is here where we can apply the method to taxonomic groups that have, have been studied very well because they have been money on those groups or, or because the scientists have been super interested on them. But for that subset of all of the species in the world that we know very well, our method was very reliable. Here on this plot, you can see the actual number of species in 15 taxonomic groups that we know well against the number of species that are predicted by our method. And that line that you see there, that gray line, is the one-to-one -one line. And as you can see, for every species that we know very well, or method predicted, the number of species that was very similar to what we know. And again, that kind of is the sweet part of this one method, is the fact that it, it can be validated. The, now that we had a method that predicts the number of species that can be applied to the entire world, we decided to now figure out how many species are there in total for the world. For the world. And what we found is that in the entire planet, there are 8.9 8, 8 million species. Isn't that cool, man? Uh, so I, I, you can guys not imagine the, the, the emotion and satisfaction once we run all of these calculations and this number came on our, on our computer screen saying that it was 8.9 million species. And here you can see the division on how these species get classified, the number of species by, by major kingdom on Earth and in the oceans and eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are these taxonomic groups that are normally uh, unicellular, but the, the thing that differentiates the prokaryotes is the fact that they have not a nucleus that contains the DNA, as opposed to the eukaryotes, the people, uh, species like you or me, that had a, a cell, and inside that cell there is a nucleus. So prokaryotes are mostly archaea and bacteria. And one of the things that is interesting here, though, was how our calculation came saying that there were easily 8.9 million species of eukaryotes. Most of the species that we see in the planet today are eukaryotes, where, while prokaryotes, which are bacteria, that you would think there would be millions of species or methods calculated that there are only 10,000 species. So that was a huge controversy that this paper generated. And you can see that on the blogs of this paper. And we speculate that the reason for this difference is the fact of that uh, horizontal gene transfer that is very common between archaea and bacteria, right, phylogenies. Uh, species that have been evolving through different uh, phylogenetic pathways that over time they come across. You don't see that in eukaryotes or very rarely with hybridization, as, as we pointed out earlier. Another interesting aspect of our results was the contrast between Earth and the oceans, right? Well, in the total Earth, there are uh, easily uh, 8.9 million species. In the oceans, we found 2.2 million species. So that's another interesting thing. How is it that if the oceans are much bigger, they had much fewer species than on land. 
the, the, the reasoning that we provide for this result is the fact that while the oceans indeed are much larger, they are also a lot more connected. While on land, you had a lot of topographical characteristics that pose barriers to dispersals, to dispersal that then allow you to set up bi uh, biogeographical regions that are very distant between pl from place to place that then allows the species to adapt. And that's why we speculate that you get most of the species in the world on land. Again, it's just the fact that there are more chances for speciation than uh, in the oceans. With this number in mind now, that there are 8.9 million species, or paper actually highlighted numerous uh, consequences of, of, of what is at stake for the planet. Let's review, sorry, the implications. Let's review a couple, impl three implications that we point out on that paper. The first one is that when you look at the average number of species described over the last 20 years, that number is about 6,200 species every year the average number of species described on the last 20 years is 6,200, right? So that means that if we had 1.5 million species with a name, that means that the gap that needs to, to be filled will take us 1,200 years. Isn't that mind-blowing? At the current rate that we are describing these species, it will take us 1,200 years to describe the remaining species that we share the planet with. The other implication of our paper that we point out there is that today it's not cheap to describe a species. Not only you had to go to the field, collect the species, you had to uh, store them, you had to transport them, you had to keep a, a facility where you keep the, the samples safe, and then you had to pay the, the scientists to elaborate to describe the species. That's expensive. It has been calculated that the average price for describing a new species is 48,000 once you account for all of the costs that go into this meaning that describing the species that are left will cost in the order of $364 billion. So if we're not really fixing climate change that is killing us, but really you gotta think where we are ever gonna put that kind of money towards describing the remaining of species in the planet, which again is just kind of as a reality of how much do we care for the species that we share the planet with. This is another interesting implication when you look at the person that describes his species, what is called a taxonomist, that, that person in average, of all of the taxonomists that are there today, describe an average of about 24.8 species, 25 species on average. So obviously it takes time to describe species, and on average, all of the taxonomists describe 25 species in a lifetime, meaning that we will need an army of 300,000 and three taxonomists to describe the species that are left. So obviously this is not gonna be this idea of us trying to describe the species that are left in the world is a very non-trivial uh, task that is ahead, not only in the terms in terms of the money that will be required, but in terms of the people that need to be focusing on describing these species. So how many species are there in reality? Well, even our method, right, is still an indirect method. It's an approximation that has been validated, but the reality is that there is uncertainty to it. But regardless of how many species are there in the world, what we know for certain is that every time that we go and look for new species, we come out with new species. On average, we have been describing 6,200 species per year, but there are unique years. Like for instance, this one year in 2007, there were major expeditions on this one year. And when they came back, they discovered 17,000 new species. So again, these are expeditions that are done every now and then. In this year alone, 17,000 new species were described. And the species, new ones, the ones that have put a name for the first time, are everywhere. You have species, new species found on the in the oceans, on terrestrial ecosystems. There are some species that are beautiful, some species that are ugly, some species that are large, some species that are very small. Now, the thing that is more problematic now is that with the advance of genetic tools, we have started to sample the species from around the world, and there are certain times when you look at all of the species, the way that we describe, it, describe them as new is based on their morphology, right, how they look. But now that we have access to genetic understanding, what we have come to realize that many species that look almost identical in reality are in fact genetic species, uh, species that, that are genetically already very different. Here are some examples, again, of species that look almost identical, that on the eye of a, a taxonomy could be regarded as a new species, but when they were analyzed genetically, they were in fact genetic, genetically di different species. It has been suggested that with this advance on molecular biology and our capacity to better distinguish species, we could potentially double or triple the number of species that we had names for.
Now, with that being said, again, I, I want to clarify that while we get a, a relatively good approximation of how many species are there in the world, there is still uncertainty on that. But with that being said, also, we need to also start looking at where those species in the world, what we call here in, in spatial patterns on a species richness. And generally speaking, though, assuming that everything is correct, one thing that has been observed is that in reality, when you look at most a lot of different taxa, most of the species had a peak on their richness in the tropics. Here is an example of a paper that I published in Ecology with Ross Robertson from the Smithsonian back in the day. And again, this is fishes and this is latitude. And what you can see here is that somewhere around the tropics, there is a peak on the number of species and the number of species declines towards higher latitudes and towards lower latitudes. This is what is called the latitudinal gradient in a species richness. This is a paper by Willick that took all of the scientific papers that have been published up to, year, up to that year. And he found that in all of those scientific papers, almost all of them show a negative relationship between the number of species and latitude. Basically, as you increase latitude, you decrease the number of species richness. And again, here you can see how that pattern of there being a negative relationship is found. It's very common on almost every taxonomic group from mammals, birds, eh, 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 those are amphibians, fishes, and you name it. Right, only rare cases you get um, that pattern being different. But there are problems though. As I explained to you, obviously our understanding of the total number of species in the world is incomplete. So what are the chances that we know locally, really what are the limitations? So what we did here, to the first thing that as a scientist is you need to look at the quality of the data that you had. And this is a paper that we published in the proceedings of the Royal Society. I didn't, I didn't put a citation of this one. Basically what we did on this paper was to, to see how reliable is the data that is in the world for us to, to build these global patterns on biodiversity, right? So I need to start by pointing out a distinction on how is it that we build these patterns, right? How is it that people, when you look at these beautiful patterns on a species richness, how people build these patterns, there are actually two ways to do this. One is by using the geographical ranges of a species that you can see here, and they, you overlap all of those geographical ranges and you just count how many species fall on a given pixel. And as a result of this overlap, you just count how many species fall into that cell. As we explained earlier, because of, of the way that geographical patterns are calculated, you might end up with an overestimation of a species richness. For instance, having a lot of a species in the open oceans where you know the species is not there, but it just happens that that's an area where most of the species ranges overlap just because of the way that we calculate these ranges. Another way to calculate patterns of a species richness is by looking at the, the actual and sampling or sensing the actual diversity of those pixels and then finding out how many species are on a specific place. So that again, is just two different approaches on how those patterns of a species richness are calculated. Again, one of them is by looking at the overlap of the geographical ranges the other one is to go to the individual pixels and then seeing how many species are there on that on that given place. These are it's called again species ranges overlaps and the species censuses. But there are multiple problems with this approach, both with both approaches. Again, as we explained to you earlier in this class, is the fact that there are certain parts of the geographical range in which the species is not found, but because of the way that we sample the species, uh, we might count it there. So let me just give you a quick example here. So imagine that you had a latitudinal gradient, those black lines that is indicated here, sorry, in blue and red, and then these black lines, which are the geographical ranges of the species, right? So the way that we calculate patterns of a species richness by overlapping is simply counting how many species fall on every one of these uh, latitudinal bands. And you ended up with something like this, right? So you go to every, every one of latitude, count how many species are there, you put it on the plot, count how many species are there, and you put it in the plot, and you obtain this, this pattern here. Now, the problem though of this is that there are species that are, what are called endemics, right? Those species contribute to these patterns very small because they're only found in, in a few locations. But then you have these species that are found everywhere, and those species contribute a lot, and that, uh, that contribution of those species and overestimation, again, or the fact that they are found on many places. Imagine that a species is only found on the periphery along the range, then all of that area inside that range is gonna be counted like the species in, is there. So what you ended up with is this overestimation of these patterns or the species that have large geographical ranges. And here, what we did on this paper, this is a paper that I published with Ross Robertson. This is the pattern for all of the species and what we did was to separate this pattern between the species that are large range 
These are the species that have between 3, 30, and 40 degrees of latitude as a geographical range to species that are endemic, which are species that have less than 10 uh, latitudinal degrees. And as you can see, the species that had uh, large geographical ranges had a pattern that looks almost identical to the pattern of all of the species. While the pattern of the species that had small ranges is almost not perce perceivable at, in, the global, in, the, in the pattern of all of the species. So what we're talking about here is that by us calculating a species richness based on the overlap of the ranges, we, we give a huge weight to the species that have large geographical ranges. It could be legit because some species could be found everywhere, uh, but it could be also a bias of the fact that those species tend to be overcounted by the way that we count the geographical ranges. And obviously the consequence of this for conservation is that if you look at this pattern, we can say, yeah, we're gonna protect these places that have the most species, but unfortunately, those are the places where the species with the largest ranges had the larger influence. And we leave behind the species that had the smallest ranges, which we explained earlier, are the ones that are higher risk of extinction. So there are multiple consequences that could be quite dramatic of the, the effect of range size on these patterns. Now, that pattern that I just described here, this limitation, we analyzed it uh, in this one paper for fish, but I had to point out that the actual limitation was described by Walter Jets and Rabeck in that paper in the science. They were the first ones that identified this limitation of how patterns on a species richness are kind of uh, over-representing the diversity of a species with large ranges while under-representing the diversity of a smaller ranges. And this is the paper, this is the figure that they analyzed um, for that one paper, this is the diversity of all of the birds in Africa. And as you can see, there are hotspots. Here in darker red, red are places with high diversity. In, in pink are places of low diversity. And this is the diversity of all of the birds in Africa. Here are the species with the smallest ranges. On this side, these are the species with the second largest ranges, third largest ranges, and the species with the largest geographical ranges in Africa. And what you can see here is the level of similarity. So here you can see the proportion that is similar between the pattern of all species and only the endemics, and you can see that the R is 0 0.6, 0 0.5, that's a very small R. Well, here, between all of the species and the species with the largest ranger, the R is 0 0.9. The largest R that you can get is one, and you can see how here, how similar it is all the species richness in comparison to the species with the largest ranges, and again, despite the fact that there are the same number of species on every one of those geographical ranges, right? So it's kind of mind blowing how again, when it comes down to the geographical ranges of these species, you break them in equal number of species. All, every one of these groups had exactly the same number of species, but when you go and look at the geographical space of where they are, it turns out that uh, the pattern that is presented by the species with the largest ranges kind of is super similar to the pattern that you find in all of the species, despite the fact, again, that they represent exactly the same number of species than the other geographical ranges. So a huge limitation there on how we uh, construct and perceive uh, patterns in species richness because of this overlap of the ranges. Now, that is not to say that the other approach, which you would think is better, which is to go and count the species that are on the actual places rather than, uh, than assuming that they are found everywhere on the range, also has their own limitations. This is another paper, this is a paper that we published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society to point out the magnitude of this limitation of using census data to come to build these global patterns of species richness. So what we have here is the global distribution of every single record that has been done by humanity as it regards to fish. Back in the day, there were six million records. Now that number is like three or four times larger, but at the time it was the best database that was there. And again, I mean, every single record that was on a notebook that was digitalized went into this database at the time. And you can see them all. Those are every one of those points that you see there. It's a scientist or somebody making a claim that a given species was found there. And those, as part of those records, not only we had the geographical coordinate, we also had the time when the record was done. So in this paper, what we did, we took all of the species that are in a given pixel, all of them in this pixel, and then what we did was to reconstruct the number of species described over time on that one pixel. So from this data, we can calculate how many species have been already described on that pixel, right? But the other thing that we can do is feed mathematical models to this trend to calculate how many species could there be in total what we call the number of the expected species. 
So by us, again, being able to reconstruct the temporal description of new species on a given place, not only do we know how many species are there, using mathematical models, we can predict how many species are there. So what we did on this paper was then to divide the number of species that have been observed by the number of species that are expected, multiplied by 100, and that gives you the percent completeness. The idea here is, of all of the sampling that has been done in the world, how complete is that sampling on that one pixel for how many species are there? And we repeated that at multiple resolutions. This is the smallest resolution that we analyzed, that is a three by three degree. Places that are in white means that the data that is collected on those places was insufficient for us to even make the calculation. In green are places for which the completeness is near 100%, and in red, places for which the completeness is below 10%. One thing that you can appreciate right away is how much white or red is in this map. And in fact, we found that at this resolution, only 1.8%, less than 2% of the world's oceans have levels of completeness above 80%. Can you imagine this thing of all the oceans in the world? At that resolution, we only know very well the diversity of about 2% of the surface of the world's oceans. That is mind blowing when we talk about a degree of ignorance here. Right? And now what I want you to also look at this is where are the places that we know very well. Isn't that remarkable? It's Alaska, California a little bit, the Atlantic coast of the United States, New Zealand. And if you look at what happened on those places, it turns out that those are some of the places with either high fishing fleets that collect a lot of fish that then allow us to have very good sampling there, or places that had a lot of good scientists studying the fish from those places there. But unfortunately, that degree of sampling and scientific effort is not found almost, is found almost nowhere in the world, other than, than, a, than a few spots uh, in New Zealand, North America, and maybe a couple places in, a, in Europe. But again, one of the things that is interesting about this paper is to highlight the degree of uncertainty of this global patterns on biodiversity when they use the sampling methods to calculate how many species are on a given place. With that being said though, uh, sorry, another problem that had been described when we try to, that had been pointed out when we try to describe all of the diversity in the planet is the fact that our general understanding of a species in the planet is restricted to very few taxa. Obviously, if we assume that indeed there are over 8 million species, we only have names for about 1.5 million species, that means that the data for which we can actually build reliable patterns, the taxa for which we can build reliable patterns is very, very limited. And that limitation is actually highlighted here on this slide. On this slide, I summarize to you all of the taxa for which we can build global patterns on biodiversity, all of them. And if you can, I want you to see a couple things from this slide here. These are figures from different papers. This one in paper published in Nature. This one paper published in the science. This one paper published in Nature. That one in Nature. This one in Nature. This was a paper by Derek Titten, so I don't mind. I am co-author on that paper published in Nature as well. Nature. So every time that a scientist had come together to build this global pattern, those papers normally ended up in Nature and in Science, just again because it highlights the limitation of, of our understanding on that field. Now, but now the other thing that I want to point out to you from this slide is the number of species in which those global patterns were built. Like for instance, the, the famous paper by Myers used 10,000 species out of 8 million that could there be. The paper by Roberts in the science used 1,000 species. This paper by my supervisor, Boris Worm and, well, and Ransom Myers, global patterns on tuna based on 40 species. This one by Gretchen, 20,000. This one, 30, 30 species. This is even crazier because this group built a global pattern of based on just 30 species. And on this paper that we published with Derek back in 2010, we actually analyzed 13,000 species for that paper. At the time, that was the largest compilation of taxa for the oceans. While well, only similar analysis could be done on land, like this paper by Granger, never before has been such a large analysis being done by the oceans that we did on that paper there. But still, when you look at all of them, there is still a subset of the total number of species in the world. And the, the question that still remains is where in the hell are these 8 million species that we know? Even the 1.5 million species that had a name on when all of the patterns that we have built so far are based on so, on so few other species. Let me summarize the class up to this moment. 
the reality is that what is really something very unique of our planet, which is this attribute of having been live and us having come up with a method that is already over 250 years old, we just don't really know how many species are there in the world. But what we know for certain though, is that there could be about 1.5 million species that had a name. As I point out to you, that name, that number is still might be uncertain because of this issue of uh, synonyms. Now, there was another uncertainty, which was the fact that these species could be all over the place. Fortunately, in the last decade, there have been major advances on compiling all of these geographical, all of these data into databases. So that limitation has been improved quite a lot, but the limitation of synonyms still remains quite a massive challenge. And the other interesting aspect that we know of is that the best estimation of how many species are there in the world is in the order of 8.7 million species. That number, we published it in 2011, and thanks God up to this moment, nobody has challenged that calculation. There have been criticisms of the analysis, but it has been mostly about the precision and accuracy of, of the method, but nothing outrageous that will modify that number by a lot. And even despite the fact that we don't know where most of the species in the world, how many species are there in the world, or level of uncertainty is also significant about where those species are. And again, we have problems with the way that we standardize the data, as I explained to you. We tend to overestimate parasite-free species richness when we use the, the geographical ranges overlapping. And uh, if we were to use sampling data, census data, to count the number of species that are there in the world, where are they in the world, that, as we indicated, also has significant limitations. So, what I want to take from this class is that while there are still some very well described patterns on biodiversity, there are still significant shortcomings on the quality of that data. That finishes the chapter there for today. I see you guys in the next episode when we're going to be looking at the processes of these patterns.